All right. Um, now this is going to be, I'll have to uh, go through this relatively quickly. When I saw the amount of time allotted, I thought, okay, because um, it takes me uh, the two hours to explain this to the medical students. So it's going to be very high level. So what I'm going to focus on mainly is why we do what we do in Canada, I think. Um, and these are uh, my disclosures. Predominantly, I've been part of uh, several advisory boards for many of the companies whose products will be mentioned. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to take about a minute or two just to talk about the history of myeloma therapy, predominantly just to make us feel good about how much better we're doing now. Uh, discuss the difference between transplant eligible and non-transplant eligible patients, because there is a difference. Um, understand why we would do transplant or not, uh, and, and talk about a little bit about supportive care and symptom management. I'm only really going to mention that it's a really important part of upfront therapy. I'm not going to go into detail, because that will be done in many of your later sessions. Um, so that's my daughter. <laughs> she turned nine yesterday, and the little thing, she was so gracious. I'm flying her across the country to a conference on her birthday. She wasn't resentful, and she gave me the Twizzlers that the lady gave her on the airplane. <laughs> Um, so just to give you an idea of the history of myeloma therapy and wh how much better we're doing now. So um, one of the first patients identified, really recognized, was somebody in 1844 called Sarah Newberry. Just severe fatigue and bone fractures. It's a very impressive picture. Um, of just how much damage that she had done. And her doctor thought it was an inflammatory process. So what did they give her? Rhubarb pills and orange peel infusions. Did not work. Uh, shortly thereafter, there was a gentleman, Thomas McBean. I got most of this from Robert Kyle, by the way, uh, a review. It was really great. Um, this is Thomas McBean, and he had uh, chest pain. He had a feeling like something snapped in his chest, and he had this recurrent pain and weakness. And Dr. Benz Jones looked at the urine protein, and he was actually under kind of appreciated in his time. So it wasn't until later that the importance of these Benz Jones proteins and monitoring them actually was really well recognized. I think it was even after his death that it really became well understood. Um, so what did they give him? A ton of stuff, and none of it worked, except for steel and quinine. Um, probably more the quinine than anything. It actually gave him some, t some decent time. He had a summer. He basically kind of got to get out and do things and, and feel a bit better for a while. So that was one of the first treatments that actually did anything for anybody, but not for long. Uh, this was actually a, a physician who was unwell, severe bone pain, and, and significant height loss. And they called the disease Kaler's disease at that time based on this case report. So what did they give him? Told him to drink lots of water, and the doctor said, I'm going to take some bicarbonate pills. And it actually probably did help with his kidney and helped him feel better for a while, but at the end of the day, not it. <laughs> And then somebody, I, can, I still can't figure out who came up with the idea, and I've actually done a fair bit of reading. Um, somebody decided to try urethane. I do not know why. Um, so somebody tried it. They said, yeah, I think it works. So they used it, actually, for about 20 years. And then somebody actually said, maybe we should test it against other stuff. So the comparator was cherry and cola-flavored syrup, which I think I would much rather have been in that arm than the urethane arm. And uh, so they tried it. They said, oh, maybe it works. And then, you yeah, know. <laughs> So then we started to actually get treatments at work, and this is going to bring us up more to the modern era. So in 1958, they started to commonly use melphalan, and then in 1962, added in the prednisone. And certainly the combination, you actually started to see meaningful responses that people's bone pain was improving, their proteins were dropping, their kidney function would uh, sometimes get better. So you're getting some improvements. And then things stayed fairly stagnant for many years uh, until someone came up with the idea of doing the autotransplantation. That was first really done for myeloma in 1983. Um, and and then in uh, 1986, they added the high-dose dexamethasone to it. And so the melphalan and prednisone actually is fairly effective therapy, but unfortunately it's still relatively short term. The autotransplant really made um, a much bigger difference. So if you, had a, if you didn't have a transplant, uh, life expectancy was often anticipated about two to three years um, back in those earlier days. But with the transplant, we were generally looking at five, seven years, sometimes beyond. So the, the, it definitely did better if you got the transplant. So that brings us to sort of where we are now. What do you get now and why? Um, so this is... A, Bortezomib really made a big difference. So that was right around the time that I was finishing medical school and I was first learning about uh, bortezomib. Most patients at that time were on trial and then it got approved for use. That really was a bit of a game changer because we were seeing much better responses in patients who maybe had more disease. Uh, lenalidomide and uh, thalidomide um, both uh, became more commonly used in the mid-2000s. And then uh, pomalidomide was uh, approved uh, a few years later. 
doxorubicin has never been approved in Canada, and there's some issues with its use, and pembenistat also. There was quite a few issues with it functionally, and it, I don't think that that's really going to be on the horizon. And the other agents are not for upfront therapy. Those might come in a little later in your presentations. So the one thing about with the novel agents is that, you know, there used to be this big difference. If you could get a transplant, yay, great, you'd probably do much better, and if you couldn't, wasn't as good. So with adding these new things in, and that's mainly the IMIDs, which is lenalidomide, Revlimid, uh, or things like bortezomib, Valcade, um, is that if you, you still do better if you get transplant, and there's been study upon study where people have said, can we just get rid of the transplant and just do the chemo? It still looks like you do better with transplant, but that gap is much narrower, so it's not as scary now if you can't get the transplant. You could still do quite well with the therapies. Um, some of the drug classes, I'm not, again, I'm not going into newer agents, we're talking upfront therapy. So I'm talking more what we have realistically here in Canada for upfront therapy right now. So we have this class of drug calls el called alkylators, like melphalan, and we are now using a lot more cyclophosphamide. Um, tends to be a little bit easier to give uh, from a toxicity standpoint, although the melphalan is still hugely valuable for the transplant. Uh, steroids, which are predominantly prednisone and dexamethasone. These proteasome inhibitors, which are the bortezomib and then carfilzomib and ixazomib, we do not have access to up front, but they're all in the same family. And then these immunomodulators, um, so ethylidomide, lenalidomide have definitely been used up front. Pomalidomide, mostly just in studies up front. So if you look, what we do is we, the reason that we give treatments as we do is you can see that we combine drugs out of these different classes. So this one is melphalan and prednisone. Well, we're using an alkylator with a steroid. What about cyborg D, which a lot of you have probably had as upfront therapy? We use it a lot for transplant and non-transplant patients. Well, it's got an alkylator, a proteasome inhibitor, and a steroid. So you can see what we're doing is we're combining from the different classes. So we don't use two drugs out of the same class. We're trying to figure out how to cut off all the heads of the hydra. So we're using multiple drugs from different classes. So a lot of these, you know, Lendex, we're using the IMID with the steroid. RVD, again, proteasome inhibitor, IMID, and a steroid. So we're using different drugs from different classes. So currently, for most patients across the country, the standard generally used up front for transplant is something that we call Cybor-D, um, which is cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. Sometimes there are clinical trials available, so that's always worth asking about. Um, and then there's this a consideration. So you get your autologous stem cell transplant, and then you can consider consolidation or maintenance. That's not always widely available either. And sometimes, again, it's helpful to, if there's clinical trials that maybe contain those if it's not available at your center. Um, for transplant ineligible, you can still use Cyborg-D, and many of us do. Um, VMP uh, became widely used as of a few years ago. Uh, also, lenalidomide and dexamethasone was approved by Health Canada in January 2017, and most of the provinces, if not all now, certainly it was just about all of them, had picked it up for first-line therapy for people who couldn't get transplant. And then there's still all of those other sort of combinations of therapy that were used in the past, technically really could be used. Um, lenalidomide maintenance post-transplant is recommended, but we do not have approval um, for it in Health Canada. So some, some centers have been able to get lenalidomide maintenance um, based on the evidence, but um, it's not across the board. So what is Cyborg-D? E? Well, this is what we call a triplet, and there's lots of information out there. I, I don't have time to go through a, a fraction of it, but there's lots of information to say that if you add more drugs together, you're probably going to get a better response, probably because you're hitting the disease in, in many different ways. So this is the, the triplet that is used most com commonly in Canada. And a lot of what we do is it was actually based on what we call phase two dot studies, we always like phase three, where you basically everybody comes into the study and they just sort of randomly get put into one side versus another, and we see which side works better. That usually gives us the most accurate information on how something works. In this case, it's a phase two study. They were actually putting everybody into this arm. Everybody got this treatment, but they were seeing how well they did and, and, and sort of comparing it to the known information. And this ended up working very well. Um, so then they kind of went on and said, this is, this is a study which Canada is very heavily participating in. So um, they, they went on and they said, well, what if we change the way that we give the bortezomib, make it a little bit easier to give, 
allows us to give maybe a bit more. Um, so they changed it, and they also reduced the dose of dexamethasone because by this point we were realizing that those super high doses of dexamethasone, they were giving it for four days on and four days off with the first study, and we are, we're learned over time that we probably didn't need to give that much to be effective now that we were using all these other agents. So this one gave a lot less dexamethasone, and those patients actually did really well as well. Um, the response rates were still really, really good, but they had less toxic side effects from it. So we kind of switched more to the, the once weekly dosing, largely based on, on this kind of information. So these are fairly small studies, but they, they gave us helpful information. And then um, here they looked to see, well, what happened sort of in the long run. They, they went look back at those patients after a few years and said, well, how did they do in the long run? Um, Many went on to have uh, the autologous stem cell transplant. Some of them required a little bit of an extra induction. Um, I think that percent is wrong. I think that was the number of patients. So it was 51 out of 63 went on. And about 29% of them went on to have maintenance, and that was based on what their physician decided to do. Um, and again, they were, they were doing quite well. So it did show that it was effective. Um, so what about, you may be hearing a lot of information about RVD. RVD, unfortunately, we don't have access to in Canada. There's some data, but we don't have access to it up front. There had, a lot of it was because there was no phase three trial. There is some phase three data now, but um, a lot of it has to do, I think, with uh, some, some amount, the time it takes to go through and some amount with funding. And also with VTD, um, thalidomide is only available through special access. So this is Velcade or bortezomib with thalidomide and dexamethasone. It, it works, um, but we only have uh, special access in Canada. So they're probably both a little better than Cyborg-D, but Cyborg-D is still very good. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about stem cell transplantation. That's really a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but we use that melphalan at a very high dose. And basically what we're doing is we collect the, the stem cells out of the bone marrow, those are the baby cells in the bone marrow that make your immune system. We give you some treatment to push them out of the immune system. We suck them off through something that's very much like dialysis called phoresis, where we can skim off those baby blood cells and then we can give them back and regrow the immune system. That allows us to give stronger treatment than would otherwise be possible because if we gave strong enough treatment to wipe out your bone marrow, without that, you wouldn't survive it. If we give it and we saved, yay. We saved some of your immune system in a bag. We can give it back to you. So it lets us give strong treatment. That's basically what an auto is. And why, well, if, why give back your immune system? If your immune system didn't work right to prevent this in the first place, why not give you somebody else's? We have actually tried that, and it causes a lot of toxicity. But at the end of the day, for the majority of people, didn't make anything any better. So that's why we still do the autos. More bang for your buck. And again, consolidation and maintenance are controversial, so I don't have time to go into a lot of that now. Those are talks, again, in and of themselves. But some of you may have access to consolidation and or maintenance treatments um, up front. Consolidation is really controversial because at the end of the day where we have so many good therapies available, um, you know, do you need the consolidation or can you just wait and add in more treatment when people progress? But I think maintenance is almost kind of a no-brainer. There's lots of good evidence, particularly for bortezomib by itself or in combination, or lenalidomide that they keep things under control longer, at least keep the disease from progressing as quickly. But because of the cost that's involved, they're not really promoted by Health Canada. So lenalidomide maintenance was approved by Health Canada, but the recommendation isn't there. So I guess I shouldn't say it's not approved. It's not, it's approved, but they said it's too expensive, so we don't recommend it until they bring the cost down. Bortezomib is not approved in most places for use for maintenance, but they probably are both effective, and some of you may have access. It does vary a bit across the country. Um, transplant ineligible, so lenalidomide and dexamethasone, this was the big step forward for transplant ineligible patients. We always, we did have Cyborg-D available in most places for those patients, and uh, which was a nice alternative to the melphalan and prednisone. Uh, but uh, with the lenalidomide index, uh, the first trial, uh, which was a phase three trial, large multinational phase three trial that Canada participated in, showed that this worked extremely well. There was good data to show that it was effective, and so it became approved as a first-line therapy for people who could not have a transplant. So we were very excited uh, when that happened in January 2017. And VMP, in a way, almost kind of predated Cyborg-D for the transplant ineligible patients. So there was, again, a, a nice study that was done called the VISTA study, where they gave uh, Val Valcade in combination with melphalan and prednisone. And no big surprise, it worked better than just melphalan and prednisone. Um, but uh, I think we've just found that uh, because patients with kidney failure have trouble taking melphalan and because of the toxicity, that many places have probably moved to Cyborg-D. But this is quite a reasonable option as well.
Um, and again, like I said, all the other old ones are still sort of available. So um, just a couple words on transplant eligibility. Um, how do we make that decision? Some of it's based on age, but it's not all age. It's how well you are. Can you get to a transplant center? And at the end of the day, do you say yes or no? Because we won't do anything that somebody doesn't let us do. So there's a few features that go into transplant eligibility. So if you're eligible, well, then you go that auto road. If you're ineligible, well, then how do we decide? Now that we have several options, how do we decide which one to use? Again, some of that depends on age. It depends on your performance status, how well you get around. Comorbidities, do you have other illnesses? If you have a lot of nerve damage already from diabetes, I might give you the lenalidomide because it doesn't cause the nerve damage. But if you have a lot of gut grief, when you maybe you get more trouble with the oral lenalidomide than you get with the Velcade. So it depends on what your other health conditions are. Where do you live? Is it hard for you to get in for visits? We might give you the pill form as opposed to something you require an injection or an IV and some extent patient preference. So the European Myeloma Network actually came up with this really nice summary. Their practice is similar to ours, and they came up with this really nice little summary that kind of gives a pathway to go down for patients uh, for, for non, uh, who cannot get transplant. And then you'll hear lots about this later, but one thing I always just remind when I'm teaching medical students and residents, it's not just about the chemo. You have to treat everything else. You have to treat the bone pain, make sure they get proper pain control. I think you're going to hear something about marijuana later. We're seeing a lot more of that now. Um, you have to, sometimes people need surgery before they can get their chemo because their bones are that unstable. You have to give them something called bisphosphonates. So, you know, if you've had high calcium levels, then you need a bisphosphonate to bring your calcium levels down. And it also helps to protect your bones from further damage. If you have kidney failure, you might need some treatments to help boost your kidneys. You may even need dialysis for a while, forever, to help your kidneys. Um, we have to treat infections more aggressively, so we can't just let infections ride like we could maybe with other patients. We have to recognize them early, treat them appropriately. Um, and also, there's a very high propensity to shingles. So with many of the chemos, we have to make sure that you're on a, a pill to prevent shingles. And the vaccines, we really don't know how well they work in an immune system that's not working in the first place. So really, the, the acyclovir, the, the, the pill to prevent shingles, is, is still really, really important for many patients with myeloma. So it's, not just, chemo, it's not, all, not just all about chemo for us. It's about everything else we have to do to treat you. That's really all part of your treatment, uh, not just up front, really, but I guess in the long-term management of the disease. So I guess what's so exciting, that is an actual interchange in I think it's Dallas or Houston, which is why I'm never, ever moving there. So we have so many choices, but it's confusing because there's so many. Which way do we turn? What do we use first? Uh, with more options come more choices. That can be really hard. There's the financial aspect. As new treatments come on board, they're great, but there's also a financial aspect to it. What can and can't be approved. There's space and time for giving new medications sometimes, depending on which ones are coming up. So there's a lot of things to consider, not just an upfront treatment of myeloma, but actually will, will pertain to the, um, to the you know, relapse refractory disease as well. So a lot to consider.